might seem strange to us now in 21st century England that being a committed Catholic could be dangerous or even deadly, but that was definitely the situation in 17th century Britain. By the time of St Edmund Arrowsmith's execution in 1628, many had died at Tyburn in London for their faith. In fact, those dangers would continue long past the life of St Edmund Arrowsmith himself, right up to 1680. This idea of sacrifice and giving up of oneself is at the heart of the Christian message as we remember the death and resurrection of Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. Amen. Hopefully we won't be put in physical danger for our faith, but even in our world today, some people are having to do exactly that. Welcome to the Church of St Oswald and St Edmund Arrowsmith in Ashton in Makerfield. I'm Father John Gorman and for the last 12 months I've been parish priest here in this church which holds the shrine of the Holy Hand of St Edmund Arrowsmith. And in this year in which we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the canonization of the 40 martyrs of England and Wales, I want to go on a journey, a pilgrimage, in which we try to discover what the life and ministry of St Edmund Arrowsmith means for us today. The Second Vatican Council made a universal call to all of God's people to live lives of holiness. And I believe that there is still so much that we can learn from the lives of our saints. Our journey today is going to begin with a visit to our local high school, where some of the students there are looking to the example of St Edmund Arrowsmith for their faith community. I think we're all used to seeing the life of our saints through the lens of our churches, captured in stained glass and stone. It seems entirely natural to see them in that context. But I'm really interested to see what our students make of the life of St Edmund as young Catholics growing up in our complex world today. I brought to school a large amount of historical records, such as photographs, documents from local historians, and even eyewitness reports on the life and ministry of St Edmund. These documents have been collected over many years, and this was the first time they have been seen in public as a collection. The students were very excited to get hands-on with this material, and I quickly realised that they had a strong sense that this was the story of a local man who lived and worked in and around their hometown, and was someone they could feel that local connection with. I learnt that um, St. M. Darson went to school in Garswood. That's really shocked me. I feel like it's still just sinking in now because it's that's really close to here. I've been to Garswood because it's Garswood Library that used to be school, and I've like been in there and done work there. And I feel like to me, when I like in this school, he was just like a saint that represented our school. But now I feel like more of a connection with him. I've learnt how close St. Edmund Arrowsmith is to us. You hear all these stories about saints and things, but you can't always relate to them because you just don't know. Like, cause it's not nearby. Some of them are miles away. Some of them are ages and ages ago. But, like, with something that's nearby, you can see it and it kind of makes you believe more. Like, it enhances your belief. I always think of it, obviously, for me, as, as a Catholic, as a practising Catholic, as someone who's kind of looked at my faith more deeply by going to university and things, um, I have a kind of different a different opinion, so to speak, on what the life of a saint is. I 
do think of them as real human beings whereas the children come with like a heightened idea of who a saint is that they were a holy person that they perhaps led a life completely different from their own um, but actually that's not the case saints are normal people they are average people and in this case the saint of Madara Smith he is a local saint um, and so I think it's really important for them to recognise that we are all called to saints in the same way that saints before us have been. After we looked at this material, I asked the students where they thought I needed to go to explore St Edmund's life in more detail. Based on our discussions, the group decided I needed to start my journey at Garswood Library. In 1585, Brian Arrowsmith, who we later know as Edmund, was born not far from here in Haydock. This building today is Garswood Library, but in the 16th century, it was a school founded by Robert Birchall. And it was to this very building that St. Edmund came to school as a boy. When considering the life of anyone who's famous, the details of their early life are often sketchy, and this is even more the case in the 16th century. There are some things though which we can say with a degree of certainty. By all accounts, the young Brian was hard-working and well-liked both by his classmates and schoolmasters. He received a general education, but even at a young age, had first-hand experience of the difficulties of Catholic life as when he was eight years old, his parents were arrested for their faith, leaving Brian home alone until their return. As he grew in wisdom, he also grew in his personal faith, and as a young man, felt a call to the priesthood. Even this was not an easy path to follow, Brian making several attempts to study for the priesthood in Spain, before entering the English College at Daue in northern France in 1605, aged 20. After seven years, he was ordained as a priest at Arras on the 9th of December, 1612, having taken Edmund as his confirmation name. Like all the seminary priests of his day, Father Edmund Arrowsmith took an oath to return to the English mission despite knowing the risks involved. In some ways, Edmund didn't have far to travel on his return to England. The Northwest was an area where Catholic traditions and practices were still very strong, despite the hardships that the faithful had to live with. Often, state church attendance was mandatory, and anyone absent without good reason may have attracted the attention of the authorities. It was in this area of Brindle, on the outskirts of Preston, that Father Edmund Arrowsmith would dedicate the rest of his earthly ministry. I think we have to remember that he came here in 1612. That's just seven years after the gunpowder plot. So I think the, the general atmosphere in the country was still very perilous from the point of view of the Catholic community as a whole and also um, from the uh, point of view of Catholic priests. There is a story um, that the locals had almost like um, uh, a system of semaphore to uh, indicate when the priest was in the district so that there was a, a sign given um, to, to indicate that he would have been in the district and would have been available to say Mass for people. And that location, I think, would have been well known by, by the Catholic community in the area. What's so important about celebrating the Mass is that that's what we believe that the Lord has commanded us to do. And that we are fulfilling the Lord's command every time that we come to celebrate the Mass. We believe that we are celebrating the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And it was for that belief that um, people were, were prepared to go to such great lengths and priests were prepared to give their life for what they believed to be the truth. He was an itinerant. 
you know, he was an itinerant preacher, if you, if you want to put it in those terms. He would have been celebrating the sacraments. He would have been um, instructing the community in the faith. He would have perhaps been baptizing. He would have been caring for the sick. You know, all of those things would have been part of his daily life. Um, but he would have been constantly on the move um, and not, not settled in any one place. Sometimes it's difficult for us to connect with events from many years ago, but something that happened when I was first ordained would give me a strong connection to those turbulent times. To investigate further, I'd need to leave Brindle and visit Liverpool. I was meeting Terry Duffy, who after a long association with the cathedral, now looks after its treasury, and items which have been used in Catholic worship for centuries. He'd invited me to look at two in particular, one directly linked to St Edmund Arrowsmith himself, the other a chalice dating back to the time of his ministry. In the cathedral, there is a reminder that martyrdom still affects the church and its ministers to this day, in the memorial to the bishop and martyr, St Oscar Romero. So Terry, can you explain to us this particular chalice that we have in front of us today? Yes, this is quite an unusual one. It's, it's from the 17th century. Um, it's quite small. Um, and this was at a time when priests couldn't say mass in public. And so they had to move secretly between different locations where they would celebrate the Eucharist um, and so there was a particular thing about this chalice which helped them with that. And, and so the particular interest of, of this for us would be what? It takes up a certain amount of space so in order that they could carry this around without it being found this one comes into two parts so the base then screws from the rest of the cup and they could slip each part into a pocket ah, and right. hopefully not be discovered carrying a chalice. Right. So there's the two parts. Right. So that tells us something very much about the dangers that they would face Absolutely. day by day. Yeah. And as we know, the 40 English martyrs, many were caught and killed right. for, for celebrating the, the Eucharist. This wasn't the first time I'd seen this chalice. Around 20 years ago, I had celebrated Mass using this chalice in the cathedral school, much to the surprise of the cathedral dean at the time. It was only afterwards that I realised its age and significance. The very nature of how this small chalice broke down really helps us understand the dangers of being caught with items such as this in your possession. Many people know that priests themselves had to hide from the authorities, but here was a tangible reminder that even some of the objects connected with the Mass had to be adapted to. I wasn't quite prepared for what came next. I came face to face with St Edmund himself. Dating from the early 17th century, this portrait in the style of the Dutch masters was likely to have been painted during St Edmund's time on the continent. It's impossible to miss the spark in his eye and something of his personality still comes across from the canvas. I was reminded of the early accounts that Edmund was well liked as a young man by those around him and regarded as wise by those who would face him in the courts of law. I left Liverpool to go back to Brindle to look at the later part of Father Edmund's ministry. In 1624, he joined the Jesuit order and returned to Brindle. This would prove to be an even more difficult period than his earlier time as a priest. And he would ultimately find himself on a direct collision course with the anti-Catholic establishment. 
his journey to martyrdom was quickly gathering pace. It was back in Brindle in 1624 that Father Edmund Arrowsmith continued to minister as a Jesuit priest. The dangers to anyone doing so had worsened over the previous months and masses were being hosted in local homes away from the prying eyes of the authorities. I was visiting Arrowsmith House, which in the 1600s was a typical example of a farmer's home. It was used as a mass house by Father Edmund. He would visit here often and use the only upstairs room. It was ideal as it offered a certain degree of privacy with its corner windows giving an unobstructed view down the long lane by the side of the house. Lookouts could quickly raise the alarm to anyone gathered for mass and the room could be packed down and the people hide or escape should it be needed. It's in this very room that Father Edmund said his last public mass on or around the 15th of August, 1628. He'd visited this room in the morning and then returned to his local safe house. He was lodging at a local pub called the Blue Anchor and the records tell us that it was the landlord's son a Mr. Holden, who after a disagreement with Father Edmund, betrayed him to the authorities. They duly sensed their opportunity and closed in on Father Edmund, who realizing the impending threat, tried to make good his escape by horseback over the local fields. The best chance that Father Edmund had for a successful escape would be to lose his pursuers and make it to another safe house outside of Brindle, and it's thought that this is what he tried to do. He left the Blue Anchor pub after being warned of the authorities' approach, and so he planned to escape over the fields towards Preston. Those chasing were determined to catch him, and although the trail went cold at one point, we're told that he was spotted again close to Dover Lane. He needed to cover seven or eight miles to safety, but he barely managed one before disaster struck, his horse pulling up and refusing to jump a ditch. After a few attempts, he abandoned the animal and went on foot. Unsurprisingly, his pursuers soon caught up and he was dragged to the ground nearby. This is the spot where St Edmund was captured. With this, his public ministry as a priest came to an end. His life would now ultimately bear the witness of that of a martyr. Father Edmund was taken to a local pub to be imprisoned while more formal arrangements could be made. This is the cellar of the Boar's Head pub just outside of Brindle and it dates from the time of St Edmund Arrowsmith and it was to this place that St Edmund was brought following his capture in the fields not far from here. There are four rooms in this cellar and it would have been in one of these rooms that he was held prisoner overnight before he was taken to Lancaster Castle the next day. On his arrival here, he was searched from head to toe and what little money he had was taken from him and spent in the pub upstairs. Founded in 1092 on the site of an old Roman fort, Lancaster Castle was one of the most important and strategic locations of provincial power for the northwest of England. And it was here that St Edmund Arrowsmith was brought after his arrest in Brindle. Father Arrowsmith's time at Lancaster Castle was quite brief. Arriving in mid-August, 
he would be imprisoned here to await trial before an Assizes judge. Housed with other prisoners, he waited for around 10 days before the circuit judge, Henry Yelverton, arrived to hear the cases of those imprisoned. Father Edmund was not the only priest being held in Lancaster. The records tell us that there were at least two others, Father John Southworth and Father Ambrose Barlow, who were being held at the same time. Such was the danger facing them in those days. Neither of the other two priests would be executed at this time, but they would ultimately face a similar fate themselves in the years to come. Father Edmund prepared for his hearing by writing statements and spending time in prayer. As a Jesuit, he'd been taught how to face forensic questioning. And during his trial on Saturday, August the 26th, 1628, to the charge, are you a Catholic priest? He answered, please God that I might be worthy. Henry Yelverton was a notoriously anti-Catholic judge. He was a fervent Calvinist and follower of the Protestant reformers. He'd also been a sitting MP at the time of the gunpowder plot back in 1605. So it came as little surprise that after the closing statements and jury deliberations at lunch, on the Saturday, he was quick to pass sentence after the guilty verdict was given. Father Arrowsmith was to be sentenced to death. He would be drawn to the place of execution hanged until nearly dead and then disemboweled and quartered, his remains publicly displayed to deter any onlookers from similar treacherous acts. This is the keep, the oldest part of the castle and the accounts tell us that as St Edmund Arrowsmith was led away to his execution from a window close by here he was given absolution by St. John Southworth. The streets of Lancaster bear little resemblance today to back then, but Father Edmund's final journey can still be traced with accuracy. Upon leaving the castle grounds, he went down the hill towards the public well and then up past the Golden Lion pub. The condemned are traditionally offered a final drink outside but Father Arrowsmith refused before continuing up the hill nearby to the scaffold. Executions were very public affairs and many people would have witnessed this final journey. Even more would be waiting at the site where the sentence would be carried out. Father Edmund was untied from the hurdle on which he'd been dragged and then prepared for the gallows. He was given a chance to renounce his Catholic faith, which he refused, instead reading his own pre-written statement. O oh Jesus, my life and my glory, I cheerfully restore the life which I have received from thee. The loss of my life for thy sake, I own my advantage and the preservation of it without thee, my ruin. I die for love of thee. My sins, O Lord, were the cause of thy death. In my death, I only desire thee who are true life. Give me, good Jesus, constancy to the last moment. Let me live not one instant without thee. For since thou art true life, I cannot live unless thou livest in me. When I reflect that I have offended thee, I am seized with greater grief than can be caused by the loss of my own life. However, with true sorrow, I wholly devote myself to thee, and with all my heart forgive those who take my life away. And by that means, give me this opportunity to resign it into thy sacred hands. Close by the place of execution stands this martyr's memorial 
inscribed with the words to the memory of those martyred for their faith in Lancaster. And then the words of the Lord, can you drink the chalice that I am about to drink? They said to him, we can. The final words of St Edmund were to the crowds who gathered beneath the scaffold, for Jesus' sake, have a care of your souls, than which nothing is more precious. For nothing grieves me so much as this England, which I pray God soon to convert. In this place, not only Catholic martyrs, but those of other faiths were also put to death. We live in different times to that of St Edmund. But yet we still have in our own lives that call to holiness once again, to follow the truth of God which we are to make known to all the world. St Edmund's life was a life of constancy to that faith. That's his legacy to us today.